I'm Deborah Levitt, and I want to welcome you um, to this first panel of the conference today, uh, Ideology and the Erotics of Playbar. Our first speaker will be Dominic Pentman, and since there are pretty exhaustive biographies in the conference booklet, I won't give too much of an introduction. Um, we're going to ask to hold questions until after all of the speakers have given their presentations. And when we do have questions, if people could use the Q&A mic right here, that would be great. And um, it's because we're recording it, so we won't get the questions if they're not on the mic. So, um, Dominic. Thanks. Um, yeah, just for the sake of this visibility, thanks. Um, thanks, Deborah. Thanks, everyone, for coming on this not so lovely day. Um, this piece is a, I've condensed down a rather epic chapter from a book. Um, it could have almost been its own book into the 25 minutes, so it will be a little impressionistic. I'm going to be throwing the dots at you, and hopefully by the end there'll be some um, lines between them. Uh, but it's uh, on social lubrication between the digital and the, it's easier to write than say, chthonic. <laughs> um, so one of the one of the premises of this uh, conference, as written by Trebor, not to be confused with Playbor, is social participation is the oil of the digital economy. And this uh, metaphor leapt out at me when I read the, um, read the mission statement, uh, given that I was writing about oil at that moment. Um, so I hope. There's no way to get like slightly less lights, is there? Or is it, is it either just off or on? Maybe at the front they could be dimmed a little. Thanks. Um, so I'll also try to move to the side. Um, so yeah, what happens to digital labor when the oil runs out, both literally and metaphorically? Okay, so this is a cartoon by um, Kleiben. Uh, the boss is saying, it's a deal then. You'll make $3 every time you think of a chicken and a dollar extra if it's a brown one. And he's going, thank you, sir. I hope the company will be proud of me and thinking, wow, I should be able to think of at least four chickens a day. And that's $14, not even counting brown ones. I'm not sure about his math there, but he... Um, I, I just use this to contextualize the talk a little bit because it, it summarizes beautifully, I think, the conditions of immaterial labor. <clears throat> it's uh, the, the no-collar experience, and it, it, it also speaks a little bit to uh, academic work. Sometimes I feel like you're getting paid to think of particular colored chickens. <laughs> and getting extra, of course, if they're brown. Um, so another dot on this impressionistic map uh, is from Stephen Shaviro's piece, The Life and Death of Postmodern Emotions, when he says that international corporate culture uh, plays the same role in postmodern society that nature played in earlier times. It's the inescapable point of reference for our human efforts, the ultimate horizon of our understandings, the background before which and against uh, we must perform, whether in science, culture, art, commerce, or politics. Um, so, in other words, the, the, the nature-culture distinction, um, which has been threatened to evaporate for a long time, for Shaviro, is, is uh, game over. Um, so, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to read that, or expect you to. <laughs> um, I'm just doing a little visual comparison here. Forget about the content for now. But um, economy, as a concept, is one of the oldest um, going back to the notion of uh, organizing and arranging the domestic, the oikos of the home, economy, oikos in the Greek. Um, very long uh, esteemed history of managing affairs, of doing one's own business in the private sphere and the public sphere. Compare that to ecology, which uh, etymologically speaking, historically speaking, uh, is, is just arrived on the stage. 
um, from Heckel's book, General Morphology, 1866. Um, so according to the logic of the supplement, economy is no longer the same once the word ecology is coined, creating an entirely new object, that is, the environment. So the environment becomes uh, a reified object as soon as we term uh, ecology as opposed to economy. Economy becomes considered in ecological terms and vice versa. Um, so the types of investments, the types of uh, exchanges, the way we think about how uh, objects and subjects circulate. Uh, think of Georges Bataille, for instance, who talks of restricted economies, kind of uh, market symbolic economies, um, of local exchanges as opposed to, or rather nestled within, sorry, the general economy, the wider universal symbolic economy of material exchanges. So the planet itself, the stars, the animals, everything's part of a generalized economy. It's not just, you know, uh, business. So cosmic ecology is considered according to the economic parameters of accumulation and release. So I'm really just trying to establish how um, young the concept of ecology is, and yet it sort of straddles the shoulders of economy in terms of mapping, in terms of concept. <clears throat> Now this slide is pretty much pointless because it doesn't work, but I was going to show, and probably for time it's best I don't, but I was gonna show a small clip from a, a documentary film, I believe, called American Casino, which talks of how um, <clears throat> in middle America, because of all the foreclosures that have been happening, there's a lot of abandoned swimming pools. And because of that, there's huge swarms of mosquitoes appearing and Nile, uh, West Nile virus and things like that. And you couldn't, you couldn't go to J.G. Ballard for a better um, example of the apocalyptic symbiosis of economy and ecology, how uh, tightly coiled they are, um, probably always, but in cases like that, um, explicitly now. Um, so, <laughs> it doesn't do it anymore, probably because I've put it enough times into Google that it recognizes it as a phrase. But at the beginning of my chapter, when I was doing research, I'd type in liberal economy, and it would ask me, did you mean liberal economy? And I'd say emphatically, no, <laughs> I did not mean that. Um, because one, one distinction I want to set up is that, it, is that of a libidinal economy, um, the kind of symbolic, affective economy, as opposed to a liberal economy. And that's complex, of course, because um, as Hart Negri and others have shown that liberal economy, neoliberal economies, market economies also rely on the affect and on libido. This is more just a footnote, but it's to carry on from uh, Shaviro's uh, comment that Society itself, culture itself, the social factory, whatever you want to call it, is a technological ecosystem. Uh, of course, McLuhan and folks talked of media ecology um, long before this latest wave of green politics. And uh, Deleuze may call it the machinic phylum. Uh, and just in that, within that frame, I found it interesting during the collapse, the financial collapse, the TV commentators were saying that uh, the computers themselves are panicking, They're kind of blaming the environment uh, as they sell off stocks automatically once they dip below a certain level. So it's a pre-programmed uh, panic. Also some anthropomorphism there. Um, so that was a, a photo I came across recently, which eloquently pictures worth, worth a thousand words that we have um, 21st century economics and ecology in a nutshell. Um, whether it's staged or not as part of uh, consciousness raising is, doesn't really matter as we've all seen something similar at some point if we, if we wander outside. Th that's interpenetration at its most literal. Okay, so peak oil, our economy runs on energy which is largely drawn from ecological reservoirs. Fossil fuels, of course, 
but also people, ambition, etc. Oil, however, is um, many experts tell us about to run out. And recently, the International Ed Energy Commission, uh, a whistleblower, admitted that uh, the American government has been pressuring the forecasts of how much oil is left to be to have optimistic forecasts uh, against, you know, the the facts under the ground. Um, so the explosive growth of the 20th century would be unthinkable without the discovery and exploitation of fossil fuels, which themselves are organic material deposits, i.e. dead dinosaurs, ferns, etc., resulting from two fortuitous spikes in global warming 90 and 150 million years ago, cooked by the kitchen effect. Known colloquially as the excrement of the devil, the blood of the dinosaurs, and the blood of the world economy, oil has literally fueled the modern world we now largely take for granted. So this is a quote from the film A Crude Awakening, oil geologist and consultant. We now face another great depression comparable to the one in the 1930s, if not worse, because this one is imposed by nature rather than being a speculative bubble. The problem is enormous, notes Wade Adams, director of nanotechnology research, Rice University, 14 terawatts of energy by 2050. We need a new source of that much energy that's equivalent to 220 million barrels of oil per day. One barrel of oil represents the working equivalent of 12 humans for an entire year. I love these quantif quantificatory um, equivalences, which give or take some sense, translates to one dollar for 25,000 hours worth of labor. So oil is very economical. Okay, so now we get philosophical. Um, Bernard Stiegler, the French philosopher, uh, plays the role of Hubbard, because peak oil um, comes from the, um, the geophysicist Hubbard, forgetting his first name, M. King Hubbard, right? Marion King. Marion King Hubbard, thank you. Um, so uh, Stiegler comes up with his equivalent, which is that the libido has peaked as well. We've run out of this precious social lubricant, which greased the wheels of both sexual and social commerce. So the Industrial Revolution wouldn't have happened, according to Freud and others, if we, if we couldn't sublimate and turn our human energies into achie uh, material achievements. After all, libido and oil are both forms of energy production, the former theoretically infinitely renewable <clears throat> and sustainable, the latter a materially finite resource. But perhaps the libido isn't as sustainable or renewable as we first thought. Um, so there's a very quick genealogy uh, for those of you who've seen Century of the Self. Um, Freud, Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, the inventor of public relations and today's branding experts. In terms of the energy of capitalism itself, the discovery and mapping of the topography of the human unconscious, that is, capacity for irrationalism and identification, is thus the equivalent of the discovery and drilling of the great oil fields beneath the planet's surface. So um, it makes a certain kind of poetic, politic sense to um, read them together. And I think I just, I can't remember if that photo was um, oil unconscious or something weird happened. Like, I can't remember the, the combination of words that came up with that, but it seemed appropriate. A sort of depression era dust bowl um, cheesecake women in, a, in an oil field. So, according to Stiegler, um, well, my reading of Stiegler at least, Madison Avenue and Hollywood play the role of OPEC in this scenario, pumping the hearts and genitals of the world for crude desire, which can then be refined into pure profits. The higher the hem, the greater the margins. Uh, jouissance on tap, as it were. Uh, so, they, at some point, maybe around the mid-20th century, uh, the, the experts figure out that desublimation is good for business, um, but according to Stiegler, it's bad for the psyche and society. It results in demotivation. So for Stiegler, as for Mark, we've all been aggressively groped one too many times by this invisible hand. <laughs> Maybe it's time for a class action. Um, so. To quote Stiegler, if consummation is that which destroys its object, libido is to the contrary that which, as desire and not as drive, 
as the sublimation intrinsic desire take care, takes care of its object. The gigantic financial crisis sending tremors all over the world is the disastrous result of the hegemony of the short term, of which the destruction of attention is at once effect and cause. So he sets up a quite an unexpected distinction between libido and drive. So, of course, people still want to, you know, still have desires, they still want to do things, they still have ambitions, but he would put that under the category of blind, kind of reified desire um, and drive as opposed to the more um, constructive eros-based libido. So that's something that won't make any sense unless you can put those, tear those two apart like he does. So there are several pressing issues according uh, to him in terms of what he calls the liquidation of libido. So one, as we just saw, is desublimation. If there's sex everywhere on every screen in every text, uh, then um, that, that the, the steam does evaporate that would cause the motor to go forward. Attention defi deficit disorder, uh, a lack of shame. I think he's particularly thinking of reality TV when he talks of that. Um, a loss of primordial narcissism. Uh, I think I'll get to that soon. And the forgetting of savoir vivre. That is ways of knowing, ways of being, the kind of eroticized ease that these afford. Um, the proletarianization of the world uh, as opposed to workers people who don't, um, who have no organic connection to uh, their work. Just have very narrow operating instructions and that's it. So, okay, so what are the solutions to such things? Uh, well, f he says we must learn to re-canalize the libido towards a positively projected future. These are all roll off the tongue, fine, but the question is what might these look like? We must relearn to focus our attention and not become distracted by shrill solicitations from all 360 degrees, of which Twitter is only the most recent exacerbating example. Of course, Trevor has in insisted you all Twitter right now, so that's a bit awkward. Mm -hmm. um, we must rediscover a sense of shame, uh, figured as a negentropic relationship to processes. It's a whole other thing. <laughs> if I had more than 20 minutes, maybe. Um, we must reject vulgar narcissism so prevalent on our screens and in our behaviors in order to nurture the primordial kind that is the precondition for our love according to the principle that one must first love oneself in order to then love another. And finally, we must rewire and recalibrate the global technical system so that it does not regulate our cultural memories for us, so that we regain the opportunity to know how to live in a mode of relative agency so that life itself is understood on a collectively symbolic level and not approached according to operating instructions delivered from an anonymous beyond, like a giant flimsy IKEA wardrobe. That's my paraphrasing. Um, so, to put it into a nutshell, if contemporary citizen consumers managed to counter the predominant forces of the age, all gathered today under the evocative name of psychopower, then the libido has a chance of replenishing itself, of pulling itself out of the dried up oil well in which it disappeared by its own greasy hair. For whomever controls the future mechanisms of orientation will be able to control the global imaginary. Um, Stiegel himself has a project uh, based in France called Ars Industrialis, um, and he hopes to invent a new industrial model which is capable of interrupting the destructive process unleashed by the capture and unlimited exploitation of the libidinal energy of producers and consumers. Um, an industrial politics of the technologies of the spirit, that is, of sublimation, as the only sustainable libidinal economy. And I called this Stiegler's Keep It In Your Pants program <laughs> for social renewal. Um, and this is one issue that I might flag ahead of time, um, that 
I'm sure a lot of us sympathize with his diagnosis, diagnosis and critique of psychopower and what he calls the program industries, um, that being the intensification of the culture industries. Uh, yet we may, um, our teeth may get a little strange when it comes to um, words like sublimation. It sounds, it, there is a neo-Protestant uh, echo to it in some ways. So all of this leads to the following question. What would constitute the equivalent of a stimulus package for a libido and free fall? Um, I, 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 it's, it's cheesy of me, I know, but I do see a profound potentiality nestled within the banal innuendo of the phrase stimulus package. And uh, just as in 2008, taxpayers in the U.S. were sent checks for $600 by uh, W. Bush to encourage them to spend more freely at a time defined by the credit crunch. Uh, while this may have resulted in an uptick in desire, this consumer-driven type of short-term investment would certainly not satisfy a libidinal economist concerned by the evaporation of more vital currencies of being an exchange and uh, interaction. How to counter peak libido, then? Clearly, the answer isn't to throw money at it, because money is part of the problem. So I'm really trying to zoom in on the overlap between a giant Venn diagram and complex Venn diagram between political economy, political ecology, libidinal economy. And then the next step would be libidinal ecology. And I'm trying to figure out what that would look like. I'm certainly not the first um, people like Guattari the tie, et cetera. So um, if cultural entropy is one of the most pressing issues of the day, if we still are in a political thermodynamic situation, it's a matter of energy versus of ex exhaustion. And a long time ago, my dissertation, in fact, I wrote uh, um, about the politics of exhaustion uh, because I felt that the idea of uh, revolutionary energies by the time of the 1990s uh, were no longer available to us. The, the culture itself was so fatigued that we couldn't rely on m mobilization of masses or anything really because we're so damn tired. I could have just been projecting my own psyche onto the entire world. Um, but I was happy to see that uh, Franco Berardi is, is saying similar things these days which is not to give up on activity, I mean, to give up on and, um, politics, but to uh, frame it differently, not in terms of an upswelling of, of energy that, that may not be there. Uh, it's a different scale, maybe like sort of slow food equivalent of, of politics. So having said that, and, and having, you know, dealing with students nearly every day, there's certainly no shortage of chatter and activity. It's not like the slacker vibe of the 1990s. Um, what Stiegler, the, the, so what's going on with this chatter and activity for Stiegler is massive hyper-synchronization. Our memories, our consciousness, um, our desires are all being exquisitely calibrated by new media. So just as we no longer have libido but pure drive, the argument goes we no longer have social networks, we have social networking. So it's another fall from, uh, I always said that con continental theory, um, the whole argument is that things went better before, but they sure are getting worse. <laughs> and I think that applies to Stiegler as well as anybody else. Uh, but this isn't brand new, of course. Society without the social was coined by a journalist um, I think it's Andrew Sullivan for the iPod generation. But long before that, we have Henri Lefebvre, who says the socialization of society goes on unabated. Um, Marshall McLuhan said that our whole life is now becoming a service environment. Um, both very true. Um, OK. So the question, how does effective labor perpetuate itself when it has strip mined affect, that is, <laughs> That's my warning. <laughs> Do I get to call a friend? 
<laughs> okay. Um, how does effective labor perpetuate itself when it has strip mined affect, that is personal investment, to an unsustainable degree? And I, I think this is a common way of reading the uptick in zombie films. Um, so I am getting to the end now. So to put it in the crudest of terms, pun probably actually wasn't intended when I wrote that. The issue is this, social participation is pre presumably something to be encouraged. However, the digital economy as it is currently configured is the site and infrastructure of the program industries and has learned to tap social participation for obscene and rabid profits. By and large, our online interactions grease the wheels of Wall Street. We are not so much the workers, but the oil in this metaphoric rendering of the social factory. What happens then if we rephrase the maxim quoted at the beginning of the presentation to say social participation is the oil of the libido, what I'll call for convenience the KY conundrum. So how might social participation, or indeed a digital economy, look in the post-fossil fuel age in the era of the hand-cranked internet, uh, when social networks may re-emerge from social networking out of necessity out of the organics of Dunbar's number. So the point is not a quietist or passive one. The Earth itself will make an ecological correction for our economic hubris. Rather, it's to offer two urgent questions by way of a conclusion. How can we reconceive our global and domestic economies as forms of libidinal ecology, ecology which, contra Stiegler, do not rely on the Trojan moralism of sublimation nor in the neo-Protestant ethic of sustainability. Two, how do we rearrange social spaces, effective networks, desiring machines, praxis, and labor without simply adding to a massive digital carbon data footprint? So for the late and Miss Jean Baudrillard, the challenge is to restrain the production of meaning. This was one of his last published pieces to restrain the production of meaning the way they, that is, the eco-technocrats, are trying to restrain the production of greenhouse gases. Baudrillard seeks to reinforce that intangible barrier that serves as a screen against the welter of information, interaction, and universal exchange. Moreover, this countervailing work exists. It is the work of thought, not the analytic work of an understanding of causes, of the dissection of an object world, not the work of a critical enlightened thought, but another form of understanding or intelligence, which is the intelligence of the mystery. In other words, a type of work which in fact sounds a lot like mindful, enigmatic, erotic play. So that's how I go full circle. Thanks. So thanks so much, Dominic. I'm sure, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions about the libidinal um, stimulus package, yeah, but if people could hold them till the end. Um, our next speaker uh, will be Jonathan Beller uh, speaking on the digital ideology. Hi, everybody. It's a privilege to be here, and sorry for the tech uh, snafu, but that's typical of, of me. I don't get along with technology sometimes. Um, this is, uh, my paper is called The Digital Ideology, and I'll just sort of talk through it. Uh, a few things about the talk. Uh, it's not anti-fun for anti-fun's sake. It's not homo ludens phobic. Uh, basically, there's some stuff about mediation, uh, the crisis of representation, the rise of visuality and informatics, some thoughts on capital, labor, value, accumulation, attention, and the wage, uh, along with the note on affect and utterance, bracketed by two dialectically linked contemporary images of digitality. So. Um, yeah, I, I hesitate to do this, but I feel like it's something that we just need to put on the table. I have a handout here. You don't actually have to accept it, but you can just pass it around. <laughs> 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 just pass them back, please. Uh, if you just want to give it back later, if you want to give it away, um, because we're, we're just talking to someone. Thank um, I just feel like it's something that uh, we need to recognize very explicitly. Um, and wonder about this uh, medium, whether it's a performance, an image, or a kind of software. 
Uh, certainly it is a form of distributed creativity. Uh, it's an image of images, um, but you can wonder, is the medium paper or is it money? Uh, maybe it was once paper, but now it's uh, many other things. Very strange conversion. Um, I think it gives new resonance to the still significant formulation, the medium is the message, but we can begin to ask ourselves what exactly is the medium. Uh, and we can also begin to think about a progression from writing to image uh, to money to capital. Uh, you know, Flusser says that the photograph is a form of programming. Uh, clearly that's also the case with money and capital and part of what I'd like to think about today is the relationship between uh, visuality and, uh, and capitalization. Um, the general equivalent and the commodity form, which uh, posited the, the distinction between use value and exchange value, is similar in historical import, I would say, to the Neolithic Revolution, uh, the ability to convert qualities to quantities and basically compare what would otherwise be incomparable, right? Um, and today, the so-called vanishing mediator is the computational underpinnings of image, uh, thought, information, and form itself. Uh, the necessary precondition of humanity, and that's in quotation marks because I mean uh, the Euro-American Western version of humanity. Uh, no money, no humanity. And uh, you can uh, take that to the bank. Uh, paradox, uh, this, this is kind of one. Retroactively, it seems that the ur medium is capital. That is, whatever we look through now, we're looking through uh, capital and capitalism. The, I'm talking about the work, not only the working over of the built environment, but the working over of our perceptual apparatus and the sensorium. Uh, let's dwell on the negatives a little bit. Uh, look at some of the classic critiques of uh, media clustered around the global 60s, which of course, as everyone knows, includes uh, decolonization and social upheavals and revolutions. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about those three. Uh, McLuhan, uh, new media technologies alter the sense ratios, a key point I think somewhat underappreciated. Uh, and the, the macro effects cannot easily be uh, or quickly be appreciated. Um, it's only with the rise, he argues, of electronic media that we begin to grasp the significance of the Gutenberg press. And um, in, the, in, in a sentence he states, print creates individualism and nationalism in the 16th century, uh, which is quite an achievement if you think about it, particularly since these are the fundamental categories uh, for um, the traditional considerations of historical agency. Uh, and then, of course, there's this uh, formulation, the medium is the message, which will come up a couple times and maybe we can discuss. Uh, Ensensberger, obviously uh, we can't read all this, um, but it's just there uh, for notes. But a couple things I'd like to say about him uh, or highlight. Anyone who imagines that freedom for the media will be established if only everyone is busy transmitting and receiving is the dupe of, a, of liberalism. Uh, he dismisses the Charlottes and McLuhan's formulation that the medium is the message. He says the sentence tells us that the bourgeoisie has nothing more to say. Basically, the bourgeoisie wants the media as such and to no purpose. I think it's also interesting that Ensensberger uh, identifies the partisan character of montage. He says cutting, editing, dubbing, these are techniques for conscious manipulation. He describes these techniques as a work process and calls the results prototypes, very interesting, presumably for the fabrication of reality. In contrast to the traditional works of art, he writes, the media do not produce such objects, they create programs. So Baudrillard, uh, the media are not coefficients, but effectors of ideology. Ideolo ideology is not some imaginary floating in the wake of exchange value. It is very, the very operation of exchange value, and he works this out in great and I think brilliant detail that stands the test of time and for a critique of the political economy of the sign. Um, he also speaks about the terrorism of the code and uh, argues that reversibility of circuits has nothing to do with uh, reciprocity and posits the emergence of a decentralized totalitarianism which operates under the terrorism of the code. So a summary of the media negatrons that I've uh, brought up uh, for our entertainment. Uh, McLuhan, the non-recognition of the mediatic basis of society leads to miscategorization of agency and to historical error. Um, in other words, uh, if the primacy of the media is not appreciated, one uh, makes political mistakes. Um, and since Berger, bourgeois organized media is liquidated of social content and, pro and a socialist, socialist sorry, content and program, 
And for Baudrillard, the code itself negates the production of non-capitalist values, and therefore one, what one has to do is smash the code. Of course, in the essay I'm referencing, the only example he can come up with is graffiti, which uh, <laughs> isn't quite so promising, but I think what uh, is useful in Baudrillard is the way in which he tries to checkmate uh, the role of the code. And that challenge uh, may, stand, uh, may still stand today. Um, so I want to extrapolate a little bit about this uh, media fucked upness, uh, to use a technical term. Uh, Debray, uh, said, Regis Debray says uh, submission rhymes with transmission, and I think that's a useful um, uh, maxim. History of sign function uh, is organized by platforms. Uh, I think this is oh, this is where I'm going anyway, and it's a, it's a, Debray does a very good job uh, in media manifestos um, organizing this argument. In addition to whatever else it may be, Sign function is clearly extra semiotic. In other words, it's practical material. And of course, Debray is not the only person to uh, speak about this, but it's, um, it's a key um, element for his uh, shift from a communications model to a mediations model. And then there's, um, uh, alongside uh, this uh, situation of uh, signification, which is being transformed by technologies, there's uh, um, work on the rise of visuality, uh, Mirzov Gottsich and some of my own stuff. Um, I've given here a all too brief history of visuality where you could take intellectual history as a kind of symptom. Um, the history of the human sciences might be read as an indexical phenomenologicon of sign function. In other words, it offers a periodization of verbal sign effects in relation to the technologically mediated recession of the real. So with linguistics and structuralism, structuralist anthropology, you get the split between the signifier and uh, the signified. Uh, with psychoanalysis, which coincides with the rise of cinema and semiotics. Uh, you get uh, parapraxis and the emergence of um, the unconscious through the structure of the gap. Uh, basically, uh, the breakdown of language function allows for the detection or the invention or discovery of the unconscious. As we've heard, I would say that it's um, closer to an invention um, or a, a change in um, a change which is uh, symptomatic of shifting lingu linguistic function in response to the onslaught of visuality. Um, another thing you get in this situation is the meaning of meaning. So meaning is not to be taken on its own terms, but meaning itself has meaning in another domain. Post-structuralism deconstruction um, with, with the allied phenomenon of aphanesis um, and the erasure of the writing of be the word being under erasure, you get the, uh, the further distancing and distanciation of the real from um, representation uh, in this tradition. Postmodernism with the virtuality simulation and Jameson's idea of the waning of historicity. Uh, again, a, a, an even a greater level of alienation, which um, Gossage says was unthinkable in prior centuries. Uh, these discursive uh, frames for the staging of the exit of the real from representation, I would say, are to be correlated with the intensifying penetration of the life world by technologies of uh, the visual. And um, obviously, I can't index them all here, but one could begin to do this work uh, in much more detail. Uh, the parametric instrument is the instrumentalization of the signifier from advertising to torture. Uh, signifiers function in another domain. They're organized by higher orders of programming. And that becomes a kind of, um, uh, as a result, the image is one of those forms of programming. It results in a kind of informatics. Informatics 1.0, I say, um, we could think of as advertising, uh, where uh, a fantasy inter in, uh, induces a kind of existential crisis activated by uh, theater of the mind and lots of um, uh, high paid PhDs who get to figure out how to make you feel more and more inadequate. Um, there's a calculus of the image there. Uh, similarly, I would say, is uh, the situation of um, no-touch torture, where an existential crisis is again brought about by the uh, controlling of the sensory inputs. <clears throat> and there's a whole history of the development there. I mean, the Kubark Manual uh, is well known, as is the practice of the School of the Americas and the training of more than 60,000 torturers. And the whole CIA university collaboration uh, which existed to develop psychological torture techniques is a way of depleting signification uh, because its real meaning exists not in the interpersonal relationship between the two people, but in another domain, which is state policy, maybe. Um, the, uh, these are used precisely, uh, these use precisely the logistics of capitalist media, control of sensory inputs, sensory deprivation, uh, the whole situation of theater, ego up, ego down. It's interesting to note that at the same time the CIA was doing School of the Americas, they were also working on the worldwide dissemination of abstract expressionism. Um, 
another kind of uh, depleted signifier, which um, interestingly enough, wasn't um, important for its own sake for the CIA, but because it spread American ideology of freedom and individuality, right? So you see, again, these signs are being signified in, in another domain, um, basically a bar structure of, of myth. Um, so this is informatics, uh, which um, work with myth and abstraction, uh, create a set of depleted sig signifiers, which become the work sites of business and of the state and of capitalism. You know, in, Viet in Vietnam, um, not a single uh, DC suspect survived interrogation in the Phoenix program. I get these numbers from Al McCoy. Um, the neutralization total is 81,740 uh, and uh, eliminated 26,369 killed. Signs, people, um, uh, the primary domain of signification is extrinsic to the immediate context of discourse generation. So I think um, given this uh, transformation of sign function vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the image and visual technologies, we can think a little bit about uh, the Italians. And um, uh, so I, I want to situate Paolo Verno, uh, the capture of the cognitive linguistic capacities of humankind uh, corresponds, uh, I'd say, very directly to this um, generalization of signification in another domain. Um, real subsumption, the general intellect, the score, virtuosity, the grammar of the multitudes, all those concepts which are so eloquent um, probably uh, couldn't have come into being without the whole system of mediations, which I've just been uh, sketching in the most, uh, in, a, in an all too brief uh, manner. And in some ways that's the, uh, the missing piece of, of some of that thinking. Uh, you don't get the real subsumption, uh, the Hart and Negri's term, without the rise of industrialization, uh, visualization, and the digitization of media. Uh, and one could then think of the history of media as the historical extension of capital into the sensorium and the reorganization of, uh, of, of language function. So um, if media functions as capital or as, as uh, strategies of capitalization, uh, clearly we're in uh, a situation where there's a transformation of the value form that's going on. Um, and there, there must be some new determinations of the law of value. Um, I think that's still a somewhat open question, but what are they? Um, on the uh, IDC list, we've been told that uh, by both the avant right and the avant left, that the law of value uh, doesn't matter anymore. I don't want to harsh anybody's buzz, but I, I just don't quite agree with that. Um, it, it seems um, kind of premature when every page is uh, slated to be sold as a medium of labor power, every web page. Um, and we could ask a question, uh, which I think still calls into um, being the necessity for consideration of the law of value, which is who pays for all this, right? Um, and I'm not talking about paying a little because, well, I am talking about paying a little. Uh, which we all do, everybody in this room pays a little, maybe more than a little, but some people pay a lot, right? Um, and uh, people are paying for history, uh, even as we speak and even as we write it. Uh, I think the labor theory of value is still, uh, uh, should be on the table um, in a central uh, way. Um, it's the expression of the actual robbery of workers' life energy through an unequal exchange with capital. And I wonder if we're really so sure that we've transcended this problematic so that we can uh, blithely uh, push on with our progressive agendas. Uh, there was a discussion on the uh, listserv about Facebook and Auschwitz. Uh, one writer said that it, um, as someone who lost relatives in the Holocaust, the suggestion by another IDC writer uh, that Facebook has anything to do with Aus Auschwitz was deeply offensive. It didn't seem to be a concern that there are other Auschwitzes, that the Holocaust was not the exception but the rule, and that there are multiple holocausts going on in this very second that together dwarf the Nazi experiment. What seemed to bother that writer was the idea that Facebook had anything to do with the situation. Some might say in defense of Facebook that there is no more responsible, that it is no more responsible for the problems on this planet than you or I are. I think I partially agree with that, but my agreement would not be a defense of Facebook or of the logistics of media space and the culture of celebrity, on the contrary. What some um, seem to forget is that while we, the good Germans, um, write our well-informed fantasies about the internet, digitality, and the new new, two billion people, for two billion people, the apocalypse has already happened. As Mike Davis pointed out, that's population Earth 1929. An entire planet has been reduced to objection, crushed below the threshold of perception, and reduced to subhumanity. 
reduced, I would say, to a recording surface, a recording surface for someone else's message. So um, I tried to come up with a slogan. I'm not happy with it, but it was a start. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, with actually with the actually existing Armageddon firmly in mind, I humbly submit, I guess, that we put the questions of labor and the value form back on the table. If you don't think capital is your enemy, then you can be pretty sure you're working for it, and even then, obviously, um, you still are. Uh, in, a, in addressing expropriation and the rate of exploitation vis-a-vis -vis the screen, Christian Fuchs, who I only met yesterday, wrote about wage fetishism. I think that's a very important idea. Uh, while I don't agree with his equations, uh, which imply that the rate of exploitation approaches infinity when no wage is paid in the transaction known as the screen image, I think his introduction of that term is extremely important because it points to a blockage in the deeper understanding of capitalist production. If the form of value extraction is changed, why not the wage? Wage fetishism, the belief that it is, if it is not wage labor, it is not capitalist exploitation, is, it turns out, an example of what Alan Feldman has called platform fetishism the belief that each medium has its unique and essential properties and should therefore require disciplines, for example, film studies, literature, political economy. In this case, however, the platform is money as capital. In a larger context, it is this money fetishism that allows the Italians to think that value has become measurable and that the labor theory of value is thus transcended. The incorrect hypothesis, no direct monetization equals value is immeasurable. And I would say that another wrong direction is that payment and reputation, pleasure, et cetera, does not equal capitalism. Um, I was gonna talk a little bit about Dallas Smythe, but I may not have enough time to go into um, the details, but he has an idea of the audience commodity, which he posited very early. It was uh, 77, I believe. Um, may have been a couple years earlier. Uh, but he, he does give us four conclusions, which I think are worth um, dwelling on. He says, to summarize, the mass media institutions and monopoly capitalism developed the equipment, workers, and organization to produce audiences for the purpose of the system between 1875 and 1950. The prime purpose of the mass media complex is to produce people in audiences who work at learning the theory and practice of consumership for civilian goods and who support, with taxes and votes, the military demand management system. The second principal purpose is to produce audiences whose theory and practices conform to uh, the ideology of monopoly capital capitalism. Uh, he says, possessive individualism in an authoritarian political system. The third principal purpose, to produce public opinion supportive of the strategic and, tr and tactical policies of the state. Uh, and um, the fourth purpose of mass media complex is to operate itself so profitably as to ensure unrivaled respect of its economic importance in the system. It is, in comments, it has been quite successful in achieving all four purposes. Uh, you might um, not have uh, run into the work of Qi Shen Chen. Um, there's only a couple of pieces online that I've been able to find. But he argues, uh, in, um, he develops the idea of the audience commodity, and he talks about the fictitious audience commodity. It's, it's a really nice argument. Um, he argues that a firm's unoccupied capital, um, capital that cannot be reinvested into direct production, is put to speculative uses, including advertising. In an elaborate system of equations, Chen shows that industries become speculators, and in a manner similar to the way in which they might hold other investments, buy with interest-bearing capital deducted from appropriated surplus value, what he calls a fictitious audience commodity, title to the future labor power of audiences valued on a speculative basis. This valuation is held in place by what Chen calls a regime of truth that is produced by rating systems, in particular in credit markets in general. The real value produced by audiences' labor is economically irrelevant for Chen as long as the credibility of fictitious audience commodities and the credit for future exploitation have not been seriously challenged in the market. Put another way, the value that audiences produce does not have to be directly monetized so long as um, it can be statistically and narratologically posited by a regime of truth, exit the wage, and enter the derivative. Additionally, one could see all the new metrics from screen time, to demographic measures, to clicks per minute, to AdSense as being extensions of this regime of truth imposed by advertisers. Uh, Chen also argues that what he calls the credit sustained television economy depends upon the stability of credit markets and the endorsement of a regime of truth that involves the production of audiences through various institutions, discourses, and technologies that are both conditions and effects of the production of truth and about the fictitious audience commodity, which I guess would be us. 
We govern ourselves as the subject <clears throat> and others as object through this very production. Uh, however, what's, uh, and I think that's, the idea of speculation is key here, um, but uh, what's uh, allied with this is that the construction of audience uh, moves towards the construction of empire. And uh, without reading the, uh, the quotations here, he's very explicit that in order to construct audiences this way, you have to um, make the uh, connections between debt, empire, and fetishism, and that, um, the, the, well, I'll just read it. The, de the debtor-creditor relationship hidden in global telecommunication deregulation is thus interwoven with the power relations between coloni colonies and colonizers on a world scale on the one hand, and with the decomposition of class relations and new forms of social marginalization and poverty in the domestic on the other hand. In other words, there's an integration between the production of discourse and information about audiences, the general categories of sociology and economy, as uh, actually recently written about uh, by Randy Martin in Empire of Indifference, uh, and the military industrial complex and neocolonialism. So I have four conclusions, and hopefully I'll have time to show one image. I'm not quite sure where I am in, in, the, in the time uh, situation. Uh, you have about eight minutes. OK, I can do this. Yeah. What, all right. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I think uh, we should, uh, I've, already, I've kind of already gone over this one, so I, I won't dwell on it right now. But again, the, the technological basis of uh, the following the categories that are listed up there, the reader, the spectator, the audience, the prosumer, prosumer and, the, and the virtuoso. Um, I, I, I said that um, these are no, uh, nothing less than the historical, um, sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, the old Marxist point that industry is the open book of human psychology is extremely useful here. Photography, cinema, television, computation, these are the technologies for the deterritorialization of the factory, programs for the reconfiguration of words. They are also, it will be noted, technologies of gender and racialization. All along, they have been vectors of social agency and of expropriation, the capture of new forms of agency and expressivity innovated by the so-called multitudes. They are nothing less than the historical conditions of possibility for the cognitive turn. To misrecognize the emergence of the multitudes and the transformed role of the psyche, of language, of affect, and of cognition by not identifying the techniques of capitalization that are in fact media technologies themselves is to commit an egregious historical and political error. Uh, another conclusion I just want to emphasize is this idea of aggregate monetization through speculation in the credit markets. The value form is preserved for the purposes of capitalist accounting and valuation. There is, in effect, a set of statistical aggregate processes of monetization that are being intensively developed. And Patricia Clough ex expressed this very well uh, with this idea of the probabilistic statistical background, which provides an infra-empirical or infra-temporal sociality. Uh, and these metrics, of course, can be put into crisis by worker, con worker discontent and challenges to the regime of truth. Um, something about value transfer. Uh, real value transfer for capital, as well as for us virtuosos, occurs both with and without money in the wage labor uh, and the screen attention nexus. To this, we may want to add the cognitive performative nexus. Markets valorize commodities, including labor power in money form, and preside over the extraction of surplus value. Additionally, necessary and surplus labor is tendered in exchange for other use values in ways that from the standpoint of the worker are not directly monetized, despite the fact that they are monetized at other levels of the system. This in no way implies that the relations are not capitalized, only that some moments of production do not immediately pass through the money form. And this in exactly the same way that domestic work and recuperation time did not, from Maria Mies. Um, while the screen attention nexus becomes the paradigmatic mode of post-industrial value transfer, having effectively overtaken many of the duties of the school, holy place, police, and family, as well as having simultaneously become a deterritorialized factory, the organization of social praxis and consciousness by the screen means that its functionalization extends beyond what is ordinarily thought of as direct interfaces with technology. Consciousness itself has become fully cybernetic, which is to say that we are now all artificially intelligent. And value production can occur anywhere any mediation occurs, which is to say anywhere and everywhere. Uh, so this brings us, uh, I think, to an idea of the politics of the utterance. Um, if visuality, screen time, speech, writing, and thought itself are now productive of capital, that is, they are media of capitalization, the politics of the utterance, what Pasquinelli calls a material civil war, is central. 
In other words, you need to watch what you freaking say. And um, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure what I mean by that, but uh, <laughs> but I, I, I feel that we live in a time of extreme crisis, and uh, the urgency of that should be expressed at every moment. And, and at every moment that it's not expressed as a kind of political choice. And obviously that's a tremendous burden because no one can live like that. But on the other hand, all of our occasions of public interaction, all of our occasions of interpersonal communication need to address this in one way or another. Otherwise, we're, we're uh, profoundly complicit. And this isn't really about guilt. This is about other libidinal possibilities, as uh, Dominic was saying. It's about other forms of sociality, other forms of experience, and kind of potentiality. Capital logic informs perception, <clears throat> thought, speech, and the built environment, rendering, rendering every moment a moment in the war to be human. Borges had already shown the shattering proliferation of tensors stretched between overdetermination and contingency that result from a war of informatics in the garden of forking paths. Um, we must learn to perceive the forks and to act upon them. Uh, just a quick note about sp space and time. Um, these are obviously also organized by the media that I've been addressing. Um, and the time of the world spectacle seems to be upon us, uh, ev even upon our, many of our political theories. But we might want to remember Bloch's idea that not everybody lives in the same now. Um, there's a, uh, my last image was, is from a place where there's an ongoing communist insurgency. It's been more than 40 years in the, Fili uh, in the Philippines. Um, the US supported uh, government, GMA government has uh, recently been able to label them terrorists and therefore legitimate a new uh, set of actions. Um, and uh, kind of convert, uh, convinced the communists that their time is in fact passed by murdering them. Uh, those of us who claim to be on uh, the side of the people might find um, that a position, posi ha holding a position that we've transcended communism and it's time to move on is uh, a little bit problematic. I mean, people obviously make life choices uh, which are extremely complex and it's difficult to sit 7,000 miles away or 9,000 miles away and uh, judge them. Um, if you know anything about the Philippines, then you uh, probably know about the Philippine-American War. The U.S. stole the revolution against Spain, its colonizer, for almost 400 years. Uh, during the ensuing Filipino-American War, the U.S. killed between one-tenth and one-sixth of the population between 1898 and 1902. Uh, some say this war hasn't stopped. <clears throat> Retrospectively, it was called the First Vietnam, and there the U.S. cut its teeth as an imperialist power, um, developed an arsenal of techniques that would be useful for 20th century self-creation as an empire. And I listed some of them, but they're the ones you all know, waterboarding and concentration camps, things like that. <clears throat> um, you, also, you may also know that the effects of a war of this kind echo for decades, perhaps centuries. Today, Manila is a megalopolis of 13 million, which is approximately 50% squatters. And you can think of um, Iraq and Afghanistan in 2109. Um, I don't have time to go into this uh, protest cinema tradition in the Philippines, which is quite extraordinary uh, and was very uh, anti-martial law in interesting ways. But I have an example of a film, which I don't know if it's going to format properly, but I'll try to sh show some, some of it uh, from the current kind of revolution in digital cinema, which is going on in the Philippines. There's like brilliant digital filmmakers. Uh, this is Khan de la Cruz, who's 35 years old. He's called the father of digital cinema in the Philippines. I mean, he's a little young to be a father, I guess, but who am I to judge? Uh, and uh, this is, um, this is uh, an image of his. Uh, uh, it's like about two and a half minutes, I'll show. Let's see if we can do it. I don't know if I have sound out. I don't, I don't have sound, which sucks because it's punk. <laughs> yeah, thank you.
this is my last slide, but um, Playbird, right? A few scenes later, you'll see those kids selling the plastic they scavenged to a small time recycler and using the money to buy a small meal. Uh, there's a kind of digital labor, uh, Playbird for you. Uh, we should consider permanently marking this term with an awareness of child labor and the post apocalyptic neo imperialist violence of mere survival. Marginal as it may be, punk is still a style choice. Being born a squatter is not a choice. The situation of these children is political, but it is not a political choice. Squatter punk is also not a documentary. Khan uses the bodies and conditions of these children as an expressive medium, thereby revealing the conditions that underpin Philippine digital cinema, and more generally, the digital. He doesn't provide unmediated access to the real, but dialectically reveals the viewer, that the viewer's experience, not just of this film, but all of it, is inscribed on the universal appropriation of these lives and bodies. Here we see through the digital, and we know it. One confronts the material basis of capitalist digitality, its conditions of possibility. In so doing, we also confront the condition and the limit of the digital ideology. So that's my paper. Thanks, Jonathan. Our next uh, presenter will be Julian Kuklish, uh, talking about the ideology of play. I'm going to talk about the concept of playber, which, um, as a term, um, has gained uh, unfortunate or fortunate um, currency, um, and which I, for better or for worse, uh, coined or helped to coin. Um, with my work uh, on digital uh, digital games and the way that they're being produced. Um, so to introduce this talk, I'd uh, like to introduce uh, this character on the screen here, um, which, um, does anybody know who that is? Um, can anybody identify that icon? Okay, uh, it's, it's Manic Miner. Um, he's like the working class hero of uh, the, the video game generation. Um, um, and of course, Manic Miner has a direct, uh, direct relationship with the, um, with the miner strike in the UK um, in the 1980s. Um, so it is and this kind of secret history of the way that uh, play and labor are sort of interrelated um, in the video game, in the medium of the video game that I'm interested in. Um, and I started thinking about this in the context of a computer game modification, um, of which you see one of the earliest examples here. Um, computer game modification basically takes an existing video game um, and you know, changes either the code or the graphics, um, or both. Um, so it ranges from fairly cosmetic representational changes to the game to so-called total conversions um, of which uh, the game Counter-Strike would be um, the most well-known example, which is a modification of the game Half-Life, um, but completely changes uh, the gameplay itself and uh, the representational form. Um, what you he see here is, uh, of course, a modification of Castle Wolfenstein, um, which, uh, which has been changed into Castle Smurfenstein. Um, I won't delve into that um, in too much detail. Um, what I'm really interested in is what modding actually is and how it works. Um, I became interested in modding because um, it is, um, of course, very closely related to the intellectual property regimes that games are embedded in. Um, and what that means is that the work that the modders, uh, people who modify video games, put into these modifications usually ends up being um, the property of uh, the people who produced the games in the first place. So um, yeah, it's not entirely cut and dried, but um, usually the end user license agreement 
uh, that you click through when you install the game uh, pretty much puts it in uh, very clear terms that whatever you do with that uh, game is going to end up being the property of the original producer of that game. Um, so in a very uh, simple and fairly naive uh, point of looking at it w would of course just be as a form of textual poaching where you, know, you use uh, an existing cultural text and you sort of change its representational qualities and you, know, you can sort of tweak it in certain ways to uh, fit your own agenda or you know, uh, simply just to play around with the way that the game presents itself to its users. So this ranges you know, all the way from Castle Smurfenstein to uh, more activist uh, mods like uh, Escape from Woomera, which engages with the, uh, with the situation of, uh, of asylum seekers in, uh, in Australia um, and puts the user into the shoes, as it were, um, of one of those uh, interns in a, re in a refugee camp uh, in, the, in the Australian desert. Um, and then, of course, um, Tiziana Terranova has been credited a number of times already. Um, there is this concept of free labor that seems quite well suited to describe this sort of phenomenon um, where people, just because they can, basically, um, take um, an existing game and uh, change it in a certain way, which then um, is, of course, not just uh, um, uh, a form of, of extended play, you might say, um, where you use the game um, to different ends than the designers might have had in mind, but you're still engaging with it playfully. At the same time, um, it is a form of, we could say, productive play, where uh, the, the product itself is in an intertextual relationship with the original work. Um, and that's what uh, David Marshall calls, uh, th that's why he thinks video games are the perfect example of what he calls the intertextual commodity, um, where you, know, um, you have a sort of source work, um, but then you have a network of other uh, <coughs> instances of that work and uh, all these instances sort of work together to create something um, that is uh, um, more more pertinent um, and in a, in a way more durable than the original work um, because like many other cultural products video games are of course um, usually high-risk products that um, either sell within the first six weeks of their being published or they don't sell at all. Um, so this is basically a way, a way of extending the shelf life um, of these games. And of course, you know, they work as free marketing, they um, work up some sort of buzz around the game. You need the original game to play the mods. So you know, it is um, basically adding value to an existing product. Um, and of course, the mode um, of doing that and of, in, of enabling uh, that is through a form of crowdsourcing, um, which means that you're basically just offering a platform to people on which they can uh, then base their own uh, creative labor. Um, and yeah, I mean, in, many, in many cases, it's also a waste of time, which uh, I think is, uh, is important. Um, Roger Cairo speaks about play um, as an occasion of pure waste, which I find a very elegant definition uh, of what play is. But maybe that definition is also historically contingent. I think that's you know, something that often gets erased or forgotten when we speak about play and work and labor and games. That you know, These are, of course, uh, not, um, not uh, eternally um, valuable or internally existing concepts, but you know, they get redefined, they get um, reconceptualized in various ways. And I think you know, the, the, the term flavor is also meant to convey that sense of a shifting relationship between um, terms that may con uh, historically be seen as uh, fairly uh, 
occupying f opposite ends of, uh, of a spectrum. So, yeah, what is Playbird? Um, I've been thinking long and hard about this, um, and the, uh, the best formulation that I could come up with is uh, it's not work, but it's also not not work. Um, and that, of course, harkens back to uh, the way that uh, first Gregory Bateson and then Brian Sutton Smith talk about play. Um, Gregory Bateson in, uh, in Steps to an Ecology of Mind uh, speaks about play in the, in the context of monkeys that uh, he observes playing at a zoo. Um, and of course what he's interested in is that they're, they're nipping each other, um, so they're pretending to bite each other, but at the same time it's clear within the context of play that um, the nip is not a bite. Um, so what he says, it's a form of metacommunication. And then a couple of years later, Brian Sutton Smith comes along and very perceptively points out that, of course, the nip is not a bite, but the nip is also not not a bite. So yeah, in games allow us to um, engage in these uh, behaviors. And that's, of course, not only true for monkeys, but also for humans. Um, that may be uh, socially sanctioned. Um, and you know, there's various fascinating examples of that, including uh, you know, kissing games in very Puritan societies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the important thing is that um, the behavior that is being signified um, is, of course, to a certain extent, divorced from uh, from its significant, but at the same time, uh, the relationship remains. Um, and I've tried to conceptualize this in a very difficult way using um, and non-traditional, non-binary forms of logic, but I'm not going to go there because it's going to end up being massively complicated. Um, and maybe it's really neither here nor there. Um, importantly, I think you know, that's a good shorthand of summing up what Playbor is, that it is not work, but it's also not not work. Um, so it means that it is usually voluntary um, and it is engaged in for its own sake. Um, so it's it's autotelic, like, like play, um, but it's also productive activity, not necessarily um, because people want it to be productive, but it ends up being productive um, precisely because it is embedded in this uh, intertextual relationship and, of course, also a social relationship, um, which we're going to come to in a minute. Um, and its products are, of course, um, usually rather imma immaterial rather than material. Um, so they end up being someone's intellectual property, um, for lack of a better term, or they end up creating communities, which, of course, are also within this intertextual paradigm of source of uh, value for these products. Um, but I think that already makes it quite obvious that it makes it fairly hard to reconcile with traditional conceptualizations that we have of work and play. Um, so yeah, it's, it's autotelic and productive at the same time. Um, and I'm going to try to say something about uh, alienation and uh, and exploitation as well, which I think needs to be regarded in a different light as well when once we talk about this uh, fairly uh, um, amorphic concept of playbird. Um, so the other uh, example I wanted to talk about, and I don't know, is uh, Julian Dibble isn't here, is he? I mean, I, um, I shouldn't be talking about this because uh, Julian Dibble is, is the one who did all the um, interesting work about uh, gold farming and, and, and World of Warcraft and, and various other phenomena. I just want to point out that, of course, um, massively multiplayer games like World of Warcraft and uh, other virtual worlds um, work in a similar fashion. Um, they are um, very much an inter textual commodity where um, what is created is a form of, is a, is a sort of platform, um, but the actual value um, is created by those who populate those platforms, by the players themselves. Um, 
which you know, is, is fairly paradoxical. I mean, you could probably draw a couple of parallels to other formations like that, um, and most of them would be to things like sports clubs, etc. But I think the interesting thing here is um, that we're dealing with um, social networks on a very massive scale. So we're ha we have millions of users spread all over the world. Um, and while there is, of course, content, content that is being provided, what is actually um, pertinent about these worlds is the context, the social and cultural context in which um, players in these worlds are embedded. And that's something that can, to a certain extent, be designed into the gameplay of those games. But uh, at the same time, you can't achieve that without players engaging with players and performing um, something that could be uh, characterized as uh, effective labor. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that um, some of the tasks that players have to uh, fulfill within uh, massively multiplayer games like World of Warcraft are very repetitive um, and are referred to as grinding. Um, so it actually becomes quite a laborious task to develop your character to um, a higher level. And I think the best, uh, the best and densest uh, metaphorical expression of that is um, that I was able to find is the fact that you can install a plugin for World of Warcraft that allows you to play Bejeweled within World of Warcraft. So while your character is you know, grinding away and um, I don't know, mining iron ore or killing rats or something. Um, you, know, you can automate that process to a certain uh, extent and then you can, uh, you can actually just sit there and monitor your character working away while you yourself are playing a game within the game. Um, so it's this curious doubling that I think um, also expresses the way that um, that play and labor are intertwined uh, in these contexts. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about the, the ideology of play, um, which I think is basically something that I can only define negatively. It, it cloaks or masks um, what is really going on um, when we're talking about computer game modification or the generation of value um, through effective labor in virtual worlds or within uh, massively multiplayer games. Um, so the generation of value is put under erasure by the fact these, these environments are presented uh, and present themselves as games. And of course they are games, they're playful. Um, but at the same time, um, what is happening within them is that um, a form of sociality is being produced and um, is, is stabilized through uh, the repetition of uh, fairly simple interactions between the players. Um, so you know, we could use the term of the social factory to describe this. That, and it is, I like the term of the social factory because um, on the one hand it is a factory that produces the social and on the, on the other hand it is, a, um, <coughs> it is a form of sociality that is organized um, uh, to a certain extent like, like a factory that is organized um, to be productive. Um, and I think the, uh, to further flesh out what I mean by the term playbur is that uh, it, what it actu it's, it's, its actual val value resides in the creation of social ties. It um, resides in the fact that um, it is so deeply and, uh, and almost uh, inextricably uh, intertwined with the production of, of sociality. Um, so the question now is, of course, whether or not this concept of playbur is useful only within uh, the context of digital games, or whether we can also talk about other uh, situations, other uh, sites um, in which uh, you know, users perform similar functions, 
uh, such as social networking sites um, or you know, media media sharing sites such as Flickr or YouTube, um, where um, again, of course, their function depends on the production of a form of sociality, um, and you achieve that by playing around with the medium, right? I mean, you're not explicitly given instructions on how to interact with Facebook, and uh, you're not given explicit instructions on how to interact with YouTube. It's something that you know, is very much uh, at play and is uh, explored through trial and error in a similar way that um, the rules of video games are hardly ever explicitly formulated, but are left to discover for the player. Um, and so it's that kind of relationship, this playful relationship uh, with new media that uh, might, uh, might enable us to, uh, to use this concept of flavor within uh, other contexts as well. Um, and I'm also interested uh, in a phenomenon that I see emerging, especially uh, in, in sites like Facebook, which I call collusion, um, for a fairly obvious reason. I mean, collusion uh, uh, is, a, is a way of playing uh, etymologically, is, uh, is to play together. But of course, you know, it has also these fairly unsavory uh, connotations um, of uh, you know, making a backroom deal between, between corporations or other uh, other actors. Um, so, uh, an example of that, of course, would be something like the Facebook translation project, where you know, Facebook goes out and says, "Hey, users, you know, we have a great English site here, and but we also want a German and a French and a Russian site. So, uh, we thought rather than hiring programmers, we would go out to you users, and you can do the translation for us." Um, and and quite a lot of users responded, maybe not as enthusiastically as uh, Facebook expected, but quite a lot of users responded to that and said, yeah, we think that's a great idea and we want to have our Russian friends to have uh, Facebook in Russian as well. Um, something something even, even more worrying is going on uh, when we talk about things like the um, not so recent um, Facebook democracy initiative um, where uh, Facebook creates this simulacrum of, of a democratic process and says, well, here are our user guidelines and uh, we want our users to discuss them. Um, but at the same time, um, we make sure that through a fairly bureaucratic process, um, nothing will ever come of that because um, yeah, they define certain uh, limits for participation or minimum min minimum thresholds for participation. And I think, you know, fairly cynically um, made sure that um, their core demographic was apathetic enough not to, um, not to engage with this process. And you know, I, I, I find it, um, hard to think that um, they were taking any risk with um, actually trying to involve their users, particularly because you know, they're leaving a back door open for themselves and say, you know, even if there is uh, a consensus among our users that the terms of use need to be changed, um, and this is still the, the property of Facebook and we can either terminate the service altogether or we can re-implement um, our own uh, terms of service at any point. So, yeah, I mean, this harkens back to uh, what uh, maybe a, a bit um, in, a, in, a, in a fairly facetious way has been uh, called the, uh, the, Aus the Auschwitz of Facebook. Um, and, but, yeah, I also wanted to say something, as I said, about uh, alienation and, uh, and exploitation in these contexts. And I think um, what is specific, um, particularly to social networking um, sites, is that um, alienation is the result here of um, 
a process of disowning uh, personal information. Um, um, you know, speaking literally and metaphorically here, um, yeah, it's it's a common knowledge that you know, whatever you you put on uh, what you, what you put online in in sites like Facebook is no longer your property, um, and it becomes the property of the provider. Um, but at the same time, it also means that you know it it sort of becomes. Um, somebody else's property, so it's no longer a part of your personality that much, which I think works both way. Um, here's a brief shot of um, myself posturing in, in various uh, disguises, um, which I think is a good way of summing up uh, what I'm trying to say, um, which is that exploitation in these arenas is not is underwritten not only by processes of objectivation where or objectification where um, you know, the user is more or less reduced to a data set but at the same time there are processes of subjectivation or subjectification going on where um, users actually negotiate their identity um, through the way that they're being addressed and at the same time um, uh, try to to resist um, this form of address um, uh, by, for example, posturing uh, as as various characters, changing their names. I mean, that's the kind of play that's um, becoming more and more prevalent. Um, I set up a Facebook account for my bicycle, and you know, these kinds of things. Um, but I think what is interesting about it is that you know, this objectifying form of address is intertwined with uh, strategies of subjectification. And what we end up with is um, a form of multitudinous intersubjectivity. Inter so to bring this back to the question of what labor is, I think um, it is precisely a form of labor that is um, exploited and exploitable, but it's not entirely alienated um, because uh, it allows for the users to embed um, certain aspects of their subjectivity into this process. Uh, and that is true you know, for all of these examples that I've mentioned, whether it's uh, the modding of digital games or whether it's um, the way that users interact in massively multiplayer role-playing games or whether it is the management of social networks um, on Facebook. So um, I would posit, uh, as probably highly contentious, that within this context, exploitation is not simply the reduction of a human being to commodity, uh, the commodity, of course, being labor power, um, but a com complex process of alienation and, and liberation. So. I'm coming to the end, and I want to talk briefly about the Mechanical Turk. So this is a sort of hyperlink to the other panel that's going on at the same time. Um, I think the Mechanical Turk is interesting because, um, first of all, of course, it is a machine within which a human pretends to be a machine. Um, and that is also true for a lot of the crowdsourcing processes that um, we're talking about, where um, what is actually going on is a form of artificial, artificial intelligence. Right? We uh, use the crowd, the multitude, um, for tasks that a computer cannot compute, that are not computable. Um, so, but we use them in the form that we would use a machine. Um, so the, the user, the human user, is always hidden within those machines. Um, and it, of course, is at the same time a pertinent metaphor of the situation of immaterial laborers, laborers on the internet um, who are in a way hidden um, and they're also you know, cloaked within the ideology of play, as I said, um, yet at the same time subjectivities that have to perform their role um, in, a, in a virtuosic way. Um, so the Mechanical Turk, I think, cuts across all these different examples that I was talking about and can represent both uh, the playbirds of digital games production and uh, the virtuosos of social networking. 
And as a final conjecture, I'd say, um, I think it's also evident that the mechanical Turk is uh, a dilute, what I call a dilutic device. Um, I'm very interested uh, in, in cheating in, uh, in digital games and other contexts. Um, so I try to sum up cheating and, and being a spoil sport and other uh, activities and practices like that um, as a form of uh, diludic play, which of course, you know, again, draws together uh, something that is not ludic um, and that tries to break down uh, what Housinger calls the magic circle of play, uh, but at the same time, it's something that deludes. Um, so in this uh, instance, it's, it's of course very evident that the mechanical Turk as a machine is intended to delude the opponent uh, into thinking that they're playing against the, against the machine rather than a human. Um, and it maybe draws attention to the possibilities. I mean, this, again, is a very contentious question of diludic strategies of resistance and refusal, which means uh, somebody mentioned uh, Baudrillard's uh, injunction to smash the code earlier. And I think the diludic strategies are precisely not an attempt to smash the code, but to find the loopholes in the code and to use the exploits that the code offers uh, in order to find ways to, um, well, refuse, as I said, the form of address, uh, the objectifying form of address that these um, various technologies uh, offer to the user. And, you know, again, and the examples are probably not that interesting. I and mean, there's probably more interesting ways of engaging with this, but, um, yeah, I'm over. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I'll just, as a, <laughs> as a way of, uh, bringing this back to the question of the erotics of flavor, I'll just, uh, leave this image of giant penises in second life stand. <laughs> um, <laughs> and thanks very much.